Hey, everybody. Welcome to each channel news. We've got John Murchison. He's the CEO of Black Point Cyber. And we're going to dig into a whole a lot of stuff in cyber and find out what's going on. Uh, John, welcome. How are you, man? I'm good, man. Thank you. Thanks for the invite. I don't know. It's been a year or two. I'm glad to be back on. Wow, it's just fun. I mean, look, you know, we're in the cyber world we're living in. And uh, in, in a strange way, I feel like we're in a different universe because mm -hmm. it's sort of like, what what is separating chaos in the world with cybersecurity? It's you guys. You know, if yeah. you guys go away, I don't know what happens to the planet. You know, we're all going to be... <laughs> You know, our identity is going to go to the customer base. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. We'll all be messed up. You know, our privacy is going to go out of the door. You know, we're going to be in big, big problems. So, John, give me a, for those who don't know Black Point, just give me the, the one minute pitch of what, what you guys do. Yeah, I think the, the one minute pitch, obviously, you know, we're former intelligence officers from the offensive world. And so we had an opportunity to build what we'd want to use to catch hackers, haven't been them. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, we're a software company. We deploy our software both on-prem and cloud. And if we see bad guys try and break in, we take them out. Uh, that's kind of how we started. And then our company's really involved into like a platform play. So we have exposure management and and app control and a whole bunch of stuff. Cause you know, at the end of the day, I think uh, you know, MSPs deal with a lot of tools, right? Yeah. And uh that gets really challenging. So the most you can consolidate and take most of that problem off the table and focus on you know, go to market and post sales and automation and things like that. I think that's kind of, you know, why we've, we've had a lot of success in this, in this channel, but that's really at the end of the day, what, what we do, we're kind of like the active response team. Well, it's a platform world, man. You know, at the end it of the is. day, you know, it kind of started off, Hey, let's just add all these layers, right. Of tech, right. Uh, yep. Best one. I'll take that one. I'll take two of those. Give me three of those. You, you bake it around. Then you realize, Whoa, I got like 50 different dashboards, you know, Half of them, nobody's monitoring them because they've been fired or they left the company. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just like, yeah, so you have it, but you nobody's using it properly. And now we're this consolidating, better integrated, you know, one dashboard to kind of like see what's going on and sprinkle a little bit of AI to kind of bring the noise down, you know, yep. that type of stuff. So um, it, it's just kind of interesting that we're living through the storm. Yeah. And we're sort of seeing, you know, the how things are coming together. I was going to shake out. Yeah, everyone got yeah. kind of that hangover for buying too many tools, thinking more is better and more than ever been better. The right tools is always <laughs> the answer, <laughs> you know? So, but yeah, you're right on the AI side. Uh, you know, the, I might have mentioned it the other day, but we've kept this under wraps, but we've had a over a year, a whole team working in our innovation unit uh, led by Javier Salinas doing nothing but AI because our data set's insane. And we finally have rolled our first capabilities out into the our SOC. It's, wow. it's insane. It's insane. There's a lot of hype and BS around the AI. Tons. But when used properly, it's it's insane. Uh, it, it's working extraordinarily well. So we're really pleased with it. And, and we can see like, you know, a year or two ahead and it's, it will transform. If you don't have an AI play, you're probably not uh, a serious contender in the game, I think, right now. Got to go live in an island, man, if you don't have an AI play. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's all the one way to it's survive. It's got to be a real one. It can't be the smoke and mirrors, you know, kind of thinly veiled machine learning stuff. It's It's yeah. got to be the real deal, so... Yeah, most people are just a you know, marketing gig, right? Oh, yeah. the favorite word today is AI. How yeah. can we just put AI everywhere? <laughs> yeah. So that when Google searches us, AI will pop up, but then a billion people pops up with AI, right? Yeah. I mean, look, I think the smart folks like you guys uh, understand that AI is just another uh, game-changing tool, powerful one nonetheless, right? Yeah. Um, that's going to help automate, speed up, clean up. I don't know what other adjectives you want to use, right? Yeah. But it's going to make things better, right? And But while we're doing this, while you're doing this, you know, the bad guys are leveraging AI as well to make their game yeah more intrusive and stuff. Um, putting your AI cap on for a bit, since uh, we all got to talk about AI. Sure. Where, where, where is the battle? You know, how, how is the battle between the good guys and the bad guys, uh, you know, shaping? I, you know, there's a lot of FUD out there uh, on how much bad guys are using AI, right? They're, like, mm. they're going to make, you know, these, you know, kind of malware that can morph and way more code execution techniques. I have not seen that, you know, to actually leverage AI, it takes a lot of infrastructure build and you got to be a hell of a lot more like a software company. Um, and I'm not sure a lot of the threat actor groups, I'm not diminishing their capabilities. Don't get me wrong. Like they're very capable. I think where AI has had the most impact is actually on the social engineering side. 
you know, mm -hmm. if you're a non-native English speaker, mm -hmm. we can pick out, you know, yeah. like, at least in the U.S., like if you put a U in the word color, yeah. you know, you're not from the U.S., right? You're, yeah. you're Canadian, you're British, yeah. or you're you're in Africa somewhere, a former British colony or whatever. Yeah. Um, but I think I think where AI has really, really helped is helped folks craft much more believable uh, fishing content. And that is where I do think it's it's worked. And 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 to be candid, like, you know, at the end of the day, if you want to know what hackers are really going to focus on, I mean, we can we, you can get drunk on exploits and backdoors and all the sexy stuff. But the reality is hackers will follow your, your authentication and authorization systems. And and mm. what that means in real real world is Active Directory on prem or in the cloud. And mm. so the cloud game we invented, you know, man detection response for Microsoft 365. We were the first to ever do it. We extended it to Azure single sign on. We extended it to uh um to to google workspace and we have a major announcement coming out uh, at it nation uh for another uh, uh provider as well uh but the what we're dealing with now i think we have about a 60 percent penetration of mm -hmm. what we call cloud response so mdr for microsoft infrastructure 100 percent on prem with 60 percent penetration we're at 10 to 1 for every one on-prem, we're stopping 10. We did 487 saves last week, and most wow. of them all were cloud attacks. And so if you really think about it, and my math, I'm not good at math in my head, but we're like 15, 16 to 1 attacks on the cloud. And the way you break into the cloud is usually by social engineering someone to put their password in. So to get back to your main question, AI has made that for sure a bit easier. The flip side is, I would say AI if used properly, I think the advantage is still in the hands of the defenders right now, uh, just because we're putting a hell of a lot more money and resources uh, against that than I think a non-nation state threat actor. I want to caveat that, <laughs> a non-nation state threat actor group. Yeah. Um, it's hard to outspend a nation state, but you know we've rolled it out. We ran it in parallel on our, on our cloud response product for four months, zero false negatives. And mm -hmm. that's just unsupervised learning. And we're doing supervised learning as well now. So like if you do it right, you learn, you you take this data set, if it's tagged properly and you run it on the past several years of our response, it's just going to learn off that. And then every time a human does a response that the machine hasn't seen before, you're educating the model. You know, I, you're, you're absolutely right. It's, it hasn't really proliferated yet, right? They're yeah. sort of just playing it on the social side, right? But uh, yeah. one of the things we always worry about is when, you know, one of those nation states uh, spins up, you know, some AI that these folks can kind of like leverage, yeah. Yeah. right? Like AI is a service type gig, yeah. like ransomware is a service, and then they all somehow up their game. But, uh, you know, it's, it's always like being one step ahead. Yeah. But you, you pointed out that at the end of the day, it's rather about protecting your identity, right? I mean, yeah, we're, we're sure. going into these systems from every which way and any time and anywhere. And mm -hmm. uh, who the hell knows who the person really is? Right. Yeah. Let's look into that identity component. Like, uh, why why is that important? I, I think it's kind of obvious, but how do we protect that? Yeah, I'll give you like a little bit of the history, and I'll give you kind of where where it's going now. So, you know, if if you're ever like a professional hacking operation, right? And I'm I'm sure this will be slightly controversial, but this is just my opinion. You kind of have three core players, right? You have someone that knows the target you're going after. Right, that would be an analyst, and generally the best analysts are hyper technical ones that could be on the keys too. You have an operator who's like a red team person. He knows how to use malware. He knows Active Directory. He knows some networking or she whatever. Uh, they can move around, and then you have software engineers. And software engineers, they write backdoors. They fuzz applications to get exploits, and maybe their job is to write a piece of software that can evade EDR. the The challenge I think we've had in our cybersecurity industry is almost every tool has been invented by a software engineer. So it's overly malware focused, right? So how do you catch a hacker then, or a nation state or a threat actor group? The one thing in my career and experience is, I don't think I've been involved in an operation where you didn't, where you had enough exploits to get the job done without having to steal privileged credentials and leverage them, right? Mm -hmm. So the, real, the reality is, and this is what we invented and have a, a patent on, if I can see a privileged identity and what it's doing, I'm moving from you know your machine, Julian, over to my machine in the network, and I know what he executed or she executed. I can put in context what they're doing, and that, and when you when you focus on identity that way, your decision tree becomes way simpler. It's either legit IT or it's 
bad. Mm. And so what's been going on is endpoint detection response tools are getting beat left and right. They are only involved in, they're missing 60 plus percent of the time in our SOC. We integrate with every major EDR. Love the technology. You need the technology, but EDRs are still mostly focused on catching malware. Mm. Well, look at the case of MGM. $50 million spend, got top tier EDRs in there. They have SIMs, they have you know network traffic analysis stuff. You know why? That should have been a 10 minute op to stop it. Mm-hmm. And they lost $100 million because they couldn't see what a privileged identity would do from one machine to the next. And so what hackers have done is focus on stealing privileged identity. And then instead of using malware, we're going to use all the tools the MSP industry uses. Splashtop, Atera, Screen Connect, Soft Perfect Network Scanner, you name it, Total Software Deployment. Those are all legit signed tools. And so if you can't put that identity in context, you miss the whole thing on-prem. Then it's extended to the cloud, right? And so now people are trying to break in because if you're a threat actor group, you could buy initial access from an access broker. Then you got to evade the EDRs. You got to spread around. You have to steal the data. Then you have to work with ransomware negotiators, teach people how to you know, send money in Bitcoin to extort them. Or you can break into 365, steal data and extort them with that or trick finance into wiring money to the wrong spot. So mm-hmm. that's why, but it all starts and ends really with identity. The The malware, the tools or the dual use live off the land IT tools just help you accomplish your job. So to me, I mean, that's why our company is really, you know, it's funny, we talked MDR, but we really kind of invented identity detection response. We started on prem and extended to the cloud and then we layered in all the anti-malware stuff. Um, mm-hmm. um, that to orchestrate the two together. And I think that's why our efficacy rate is, you know, at the top of the game and speed. And and so to me, I think, okay, so let's look forward like a couple steps for our, our industry. What's all the talk? Automation, co-pilot, leveraging all the AI. Well, if you can't have visibility into how that privilege identity is, if you can't go through a distinct hardening process, your environment, Let's say you rolled out Copilot and you're killing it. You have tons of efficiencies. You do tons of automation, which I'm a firm believer in, by the way. Uh, like the guys at Roost are just fantastic. Um, you can build the house of cards and it can come down really fast. So I guess my point to identity is as we work more on automation and AI and efficiencies, you better do all that other work to be ready. Otherwise, you're going to be one breach away from all that coming down and then now what are you going to do? You get a slimmer staff. Mm-hmm. You profit off of all the stuff and now it goes down. So I think the truth in this game is if you can't see what your, especially your privileged identities in the cloud or on-prem are doing live, you're putting your entire operation at jeopardy because that's exactly what happened to MGM. That should have been an easy response. You're right. I mean, the humans are are the ones, right? Always the humans, right? And a factor that that's the weakest link in a way. Yeah. But you know, to be fair to the humans, they're moving around like crazy now, right? Yeah. You know, they're working from home. They're working from cabs. They're working from airports. They're eating and working. Their 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 habits is morphing yeah. like crazy. One day they're the ball game. Next day they're they got an important thing they're doing in an airplane. They're using, you know, the, the airlines, you know, network system. And mm-hmm. I mean, it's uh, if you don't kind of like follow, you know, yeah. that identity and have a kind of the digital footprint that you could verify somehow, yeah. um, then at some point they're going to do crazy things, right? Yeah. And uh, it, they might let them in. How do you track all the yeah. different variations. Oh, I'm not going to give away our, our like yeah, no, special no, sauce, don't, but don't. At, at a high level, <laughs> yeah, this is actually where where AI and enrichment. There's there are like two things, right? And I think you you should always start with enrichment before you go with AI. So one of the things we we do is we'll take you know we'll hit the Microsoft Graph API, and you can only get certain things like source IP, user agent string, and that tells you am I coming from like a mobile device or browser. Hackers a lot of times are lazy. And if you see a user agent string of Python, like, you know, it's bad because <laughs> it's a program <laughs> trying to log in, not a human. Yeah. You have to take all that data and then you have to enrich it. You have to understand, am I coming from uh, an Azure IP block? Am I coming through uh, v- a residential proxy? This is what the Chinese love using. And a residential proxy makes it look like you're coming from home high-speed internet. You right. have to build the data model around that. And you have to build all the patterns of the users and where they go and where they log in. And so that's that. And then that's how we've tackled it from when we invented this 
but then what we've la laid on top is is all of our AI modeling. Yeah. So we're taking that whole data set and modeling it. So as someone comes on, it like the fidelity just gets better and better and it gets better faster now. So that's how you have to deal with it um, because the volume of, of, of data is so high. And the reality is it's, there's not perfect logic on this. Mm. And sometimes you just have to say, Hey, we don't see any hallmarks of bad activity, Mr. Customer, you know, where you're not coming through a proxy residential proxy. You're not like spinning up a VM and Azure to log in. But we just want to make sure you know that it's the first time we've seen someone log in from this location. I want you to go verify. So sometimes you can't do it all and you have to ask the the end person for a little bit of help. But the point is you have the visibility on it and you've knocked out most of the noise. So then it yeah. becomes a problem that, you know, is I think eminently solvable. You can actually focus on the things that's really looking weird. Yeah. You know, because at the end of the day, I mean it's it's impossible. Humans are doing so many crazy things. Just right. the randomness of humans. Yeah. Right, it's, it's enough to break AI. You know, there's another thing that happens. So we we're just talking about the login process. But what yeah. you have to do, just like if you're doing lateral movement detection on mm. premises, okay, we know a, a, a human with privileged access or an account, I should say, authenticated from one machine to another, and we know it's a privileged account. So it has a high capacity to do damage or do good, right? It's one of two. What do they do right after that? Do we see or install a remote access tool? In the cloud, you're looking at things. Do I see app passwords get installed? Do I see a new enterprise app? That's really dangerous. You know, something that mm. was leveraged in the solar winds attack. Uh, so you need to look for these kind of indicators of behavior that happen maybe post login. And that's how you wrap your mind around around mm. what's really going on. I get it. I mean, it's uh it's quite remarkable how deep uh you guys have gone. In understanding the human psyche, you know, it's almost like you're a shrink for, you know, the cyber uh, folks out there. Uh, but, the devil's in the details. If you want to be good at this game, I can tell you that. For sure. It, it's when you leave off that little detail, uh, yeah. then it's when you get you get breached. Yeah. You know, cybersecurity obviously is uh, this moving target, right? And we're sort of learning. Um, I like to think we're like we're flying a plane while we build the engines. Yeah. And uh, we're getting a little bit better at it. But sometimes, you know, we get a bump. You know, yeah. and uh, and we got to get back up and uh, keep going because the, the challenge is, is like, how do we really protect these businesses, governments, people, identities and all these things? Because if this thing continues, what will the world look like yeah. when everybody's breached their data, their privacy is gone, their identities are all stolen, yada, yada, yada. Like, what do we do next? You know, every time you want to go and uh, I don't know do everything we it seems like we have to prove who we are everything we do these days right yeah it's just super annoying <laughs> it is annoying uh, but uh it's completely re required i mean you know the way i look at it is at the end of the day you have to be really steeped in tradecraft mm. right so this is kind of how the bad guys operate what they install their patterns you have to have threat intel you know, we we have a full time threat intelligence and reverse engineering unit called the Adversary Pursuit Group at Blackpoint. Uh, we have a major new hire that we're going to announce here shortly. Just a, a legend, nation state legend um, oh. that's going to come in and help us there. Uh, but the point is, you have to use intelligence. You have to use reverse engineering. You have to use live visibility and identity, be able to put it in context. Uh, you have to also harden and reduce the attack surface. And this is the part where, like, you talk about kind of where, where's the industry growing. I think posture management is incredibly important. Like the ability to, in, you know, you think about an MSP running 40 customers or there's some that have, you know, seven, eight, nine hundred end customers. The ability to interrogate their environment, figure out where the gaps are deploy a baseline, you know, kind of hardening template and then alert when there's drift from that on top of doing all the live visibility. That's what it's going to take as we keep getting more and more reliant on this stuff. Uh, and I think, you know, so for my chair, that is the next area of major investment bes besides automation for MSPs. But the reality is the vast majority of MSPs do not actually have real MDR on their cloud infrastructure. And I think they're playing Russian roulette. Well, Russian roulette with Russians. It's a real Russians. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. you know <laughs> when you look at the um, what, what keeps you awake at night, John, from um, from a cyber perspective, uh, what, what um, worries you? I'll tell you, it's not like the MSP market stuff. What keeps mm. me awake at night um, 
and there's a little talk about this recently in in the press if you really take a step back and think about like what can cause a, that you know kind of wmd of the cyber world type event yeah it's frankly i think two primary areas I can, i'm most concerned about I'm ex I'm way less concerned about hacking the electrical grid and all that stuff because it's really hard to pull that off and have like a monster effect. I am deeply concerned at attacking internet service providers. Hmm. I'm deeply, deeply concerned about our core routing and switching infrastructure in this country. I'm deeply concerned about our MPLS backbones that that run our mobile. Our every phone call you make gets turns into packets in an IP network. Um, hmm. And if you think about that, that is the glue that connects the cloud to on-prem to everything. That to me, a nation state focus, which I totally believe the Chinese are doing, and I think this has come out in the press recently, uh, is absolutely what keeps me up at night. And if you talk, I started as a network engineer on like the Cisco stuff. And if you think about like, how often do people really update that stuff? A lot of that technology, it was built because it's reliable. It runs forever, but a lot of them are old architectures, but they still work and they run for a really long time, but they weren't built for an age of hardcore hacking. Mm. You know, like we spend so much time hardening the Windows infrastructure, but what about a six-year-old Cisco switch or router that's kicking mm. ass and doing everything it needs to do? Um, I deeply, deeply worry about that. I deeply, deeply worry about the supply chain, the physical hardware that's yeah. running our cloud infrastructure. I was always like kind of shocked and dismayed. You know, you'll go talk to a defense contract and I came out of this world, so I feel like I can have an opinion on it. Like, uh, you know, is there any non-American, you know, monitoring this stuff? Uh, mm. uh, I don't know. Yeah, we can do that. Of <laughs> course, we can support completely American only, but you're talking to me on a phone made in China and a computer <laughs> and a chipset made in China. And this is what you're worried about, like a guy in New Zealand. <laughs> like it's completely yeah. ass backwards for my yeah. chair. So I'm worried about the supply chain and what could be seeded into it on our core infrastructure. And I'm also worried about attacks and single sign on infrastructure. So single sign on supply chain on the hardware and attacks against our root. Mm hardcore critical infrastructure, which is actually routing and switching because that is the glue that connects everything. When that goes down, the cloud's meaningless because you don't have the ability to contact it. Mm. Well, John, I'm voting you czar of the uh, infrastructure now, man, because uh, <laughs> you better step up and, and and fix that stuff. I mean, once I was talking to a company who actually lays the, um, you know, the cable between the oceans, right? <laughs> um, and, you know, you'd, you'd scratch your head and going, that is that how we connect the internet, you know, from one landmass to the other through these little pipelines? And yeah. of course, ask a silly question like, "What happens if a, a shark, you know, bites that thing or whatever?" Yeah, someone dredge, dredges it by accident. Yeah, I mean, it can it's happen, bad. right? And, and it does happen. And yeah. they go down there and they they cut and splice it like you do a tape, whatever. I don't know. Insane! It's insane! <laughs> it's it's wild technology. It's super critical infrastructure. It needs to be protected, and it's really hard to protect. Um, yeah, because like, yeah, that's a physical attack, kind of like I'm worried about the supply chain kind of infiltration on and kind of yeah. chipsets and hardware that's made. I mean, I, I think the single greatest national security, you know, long term strategic national security issue we have is we can't make a phone in the country at scale. Yeah. Uh, or a computer. It's, it's everywhere. It's I mean, we, like, you know, if you think about war fighting in the future, like there's two challenges, right? If it's too complicated, you run a supply chain you know, issues for a protracted war to, to have all your precision stuff. But at the same time, you know, if you can have a, a quick overpowering victory and leveraging technology to do that, like you need to, to win the technology race. Um, so I think, you know, for my chair, it's uh, we, we have to figure out as a country how to bring, or as the West, I should say, because, yeah. you know, Canada, North, we're, we'd all suffer the same, um, I think we have to figure out how to bring that. Oh, and we have a battle. We call you. Yes. And uh, yeah. come <laughs> I guess one dude. <laughs> yeah. Who's that guy? My buddies. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think you're, you're so right. I mean, the, the reality is it just takes a little bit of uh, ingenuity to kind of bake these into the hardware device that we're using. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of attack vectors and um, stuff with globalization is made everywhere. Right. And uh, yeah. it's made like a, you know, whatever in a different place. And these things are, these are the things that people can manipulate if you yep. will. And, yeah. and if that wasn't enough, you got the actual supply chain where people are selling you stuff yep. and uh, you know them, 
right? Yep. And then they're bad at their cyber and yeah. they're shoving up stuff that's uh, as a matter of fact, you know, bad actors can infiltrate much easier your yeah. supply chain um and, and get just, into I you. think we just saw a really, really shouty high profile uh, pager and uh walkie-talkie supply chain attack over in Lebanon, right? And that's yeah. much harder than if you own the factory and are building everything. Uh, so it's it's definitely doable. It's, it's definitely a big concern. Yeah. Um, you know, that's... I mean, seriously, man, do you, think they, do you think they could have done that with one of those uh, pager things? I mean, I didn't even know that was possible. I mean, but... Absolutely. But they did over. Jeez. It was super ingenious. Uh, yeah. From what I've what I've learned about it, uh, the way they were able to kind of you know integrate the explosives into the battery, not just slapped on top to to Jeez. to get past any sort of scrutiny or kind of X ray infrastructure, I think was uh, absolutely one of the most brilliant ops I've ever seen. What's next level stuff? I mean, I can see now the airports. Hey, no more phones, you know, <laughs> no more no, this. Oh god, <laughs> no. I mean. That was a very obviously targeted operation that took yeah. an incredible amount of planning. Um, yeah. you know, but uh but yeah, it's uh it's that so that's a little example. You yeah, know, obviously a very shouty public example in a pretty contested region. But yeah, you know, you think about when almost all of our chipsets are being made over in, in Asia, it's like that's concerning. Yeah. What could be done that we design? By the yes. Way. <laughs> <Is> it... <laughs> well, don't get me started, man. We yeah. talk about the battery technologies, and then we can go on and on about. Uh, oh yeah, you know, yeah. their car is a lot cheaper, man. Yeah, and uh, it's coming in, yeah. and uh, I don't know how this uh, world is going to play out, but uh, yeah, we're in this globalization world. I'm not even sure, brother, if he can actually put it back in the bottle. The genie is kind of. I don't know either. Yeah. I mean, I think it's it would take a, a government wide effort, you know, Manhattan style moonshot yeah. project and effort and and kind of give a crap to to do it. I mean, obviously, you live in Canada. Uh, remember Nortel Networks, one of yes. the largest telecommunications, used to put be out business by Huawei. You know, yeah. what a lot of people don't know is Nortel outsourced some of their engineering to Huawei. Yeah, when they were struggling after the dot bomb times. Yeah, and 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 Huawei said thank you very much for the jump start. <laughs> and now all over the world, they're building the core infrastructures for mobile, uh, mobile networks and routing and switching in the core. I think you know if I had to summarize, you know, uh, the Western world's problems, we think too short term, we don't think long game, and anybody who plays long games um, yeah. ultimately have the upper hand. Yeah. And um, because we can't see that far ahead, you know, well, and our political infrastructure can't support that. There's yeah, too much it's change. a four year I mean, term. The Chinese do what? Five year plans all the time. I, you know? I think they, I think they have a 50 year plan. Yeah. I don't know. What the oh, five yeah. year they anymore, probably man. have like 50 year plans broken up to five year you know, marches <laughs> in, in and increments. increments. You I mean, know? even the Iranians, you know, they're really good at playing the long game. I mean, look yeah. at their nuclear weapons program. Yeah, they yeah. took a little short term delay, but all they did was was increase their their ability to enrich uh increase their ballistic missile technology and they played the long game uh and in my opinion they uh outmaneuvered the united states and now here we are look at the mess we have over there i'll tell you man we are we're in this crazy world that's uh running run on technology yeah the, the new war front for sure is cyber right uh, I think people are kind of tired of the kinetic stuff, the damage it causes and all that stuff. Yeah. It's pretty easy to point fingers when you see that happening. Yeah. Hard to point fingers when it's a cyber attack, you know? Yeah. Um, it's kind of like it uh, goes under the radar type thing and uh, you can cause a lot of damage yeah. um, in, in either situation. So it's, uh, man, we're moving into this new AI era and mm -hmm. uh, you guys are at the forefront of figuring out how to, uh, you know, stop us all from getting smashed yeah. um and uh good luck to all that stuff uh john uh, anything else that i should have asked you that maybe i didn't no no this was fun was, i mean we, we started with msp stuff and somehow got to talk nation state which was fun that's uh <laughs> we're gonna solve the world right now man this is what we do yeah. no, it's, it's... it's a funny thing in this world is we um you know one of the privileges i get of uh, talking with all these smart people like you and about how you guys are shaping you know the future but you're shaping the future in a way that sort of protects it, right? At the same time, you're the ones identifying all the pitfalls, right? All the problems that, that nobody's seeing or ignoring or blind, can't see, whatever. 
Um, and then challenge until we have, you know, organizations and people who listen yeah. to these things, right? We're, we're all going to be playing catch up, right? Yeah. And sometimes I, I look at people like yourselves who are way out, way out of the front saying, hey, this is the way forward. Come on over. And you have a whole bunch of people like in the movies. Ah, mm-hmm. we, we'll get there soon, man. It's all good, you know? Yeah. Um, or by the time they get there, they're using like the old stuff. This is what I think about when people try to roll out seams, you know, to catch yes. hackers. Like that's, that's a decade old technology that was good in practice. And it's better for compliance than actually catching bad guys. So I think, uh, yeah, I totally agree with your point. It's, but I guess the good news is we need platforms like yours to actually get the message out. And it has to start with education. Yeah, I'm just the amplifier, man. It's uh, yeah. The reality is, is that uh, more people need to know the stuff. Sometimes I shake my head when I speak to some companies and I go, don't you guys get it? Or like, <laughs> do you read? Do you like, what do you do? You know, and um, and because the information is there. If they listen, right. if they listen to this, for example, this discussion, it should open their minds to where identity is. Yeah. And, and why that's important and why what you're doing may be you know, good to bring the cybersecurity risk posture down. But if you focus on the things that matter the most, it's going to bring them down faster and better because look, the bad actors are not going to go through your chimney, man, and yeah. turn like really thin and skate down. It's possible. Santa yeah. does it. It's possible. All right. Yeah. But just let's lock up the doors. Let's get the windows locked down. Well, it's fundamentals, right? You want to be a leader yeah. to anything in life. You better yeah. master fundamentals, but you know, like I was a mediocre tennis player in college, but the reality is you get, a, you see a lot of new people that you'd like when I used to teach, Yeah, they're worried about their racket and this and that. I'm like, well, you should worry about your athleticism and your technique because that's, what's <laughs> really going to matter. And I think what's happened though, in our and technology is so complicated. It gets so abstracted people. Like, I think it's really hard to become a legitimate cybersecurity practitioner if you weren't an IT administrator or network engineer first, because yeah. that's all the building blocks that then build your base of knowledge up. And it's a lot easier to figure out where our big weaknesses are when you've mastered fundamentals. But there's just so much noise, it's really easy to get off track. Um, and so I think, you know, to your point, fundamentals are key. And you have to master them and really think about like in my infrastructure, what are the things that would cause me the most pain and why? And yes, yeah. you know, when you see large parts of, you know, cloud services go down, it's usually a networking issue or it's a single sign on issue. <laughs> so, Somebody screwed except. up some issue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, John, a last question, man, just to get the audience to know you a little bit better. What's something that, uh, that you do or that, that you would like other people, other people to know? That maybe they don't know about John. like personally yeah personally it's like hobbies and stuff yeah hmm. hobby whatever you do uh well i really like sports obviously um yeah. a snowmobile a ski well not now because i've got a rotator cuff repair uh i race cars uh wow and i, I play guitar wow so that's what that's what i do outside of work i i a lot of times i love what i do for a living but i work to support my uh my hobbies <laughs> <laughs> there you go well i do two yeah. out of three man but uh yeah. I haven't gone to racing cars yet, but uh, it's pretty exciting. It's pretty interesting, you know. But funny enough, you know, just last and 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 Formula One cars, right? Mm-hmm. The one thing I sort of learned over the years is the dis- the amount of technology that goes in there, and the amount of uh, you know data protection stuff because the other com- the other camps, if they mm-hmm. see what's going on with the whatever you know the engines and all the dragon whatever, they can actually adjust their their you know their playbook to totally. be just by looking at the data. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're one of the sponsors of uh, Andretti's number 27 car, Kyle Kirkwood's car. And and e- oh, even wow. an Indy car, I mean, you can't take photos of the suspension setup. <laughs> that's, that's, <laughs> because that's a spec series for the most part. I yeah. mean, there's slight variations, but so you're playing a game of margins. And Formula One, obviously, like the rule books opened up a ton as far as how much. I mean, a lot of Formula One teams have a thousand plus employees. I mean, yeah, they're huge operations. And so, yeah, to your point, I mean, those a Formula One team in my book could probably make make rockets and, and aerospace. They could do tons of stuff, even tire manufacturing, believe it or not. Yeah. If you look at the groups a tire manufacturing company has, it looks like a nuclear weapons program. It has simulation, it has hydrodynamic modeling. It has all this crap that goes in that is just blows your mind how t- 
technologically advanced it is. And it all runs in Windows it's domain. It's <laughs> fascinating, isn't it? Yeah, the, yeah. How everything that we're, we're looking at, we take things for granted. You know, you see people oh, running yeah. around a racetrack and go, wow, just seems to be driving fast. No, it's a lot more shit that There's goes into lot. that stuff that we, that we <laughs> it's think. It's exciting. It, yeah. It's exciting. It's the future we're living in, man. It's great yeah. to have a, to have a, to be witness. You know, of this uh, revolution, evolution, whatever you want to call it. But uh, so many more things to come, my friend. Keep yes. us posted, John, how things Will are coming along. All the best. Great with chat Black with Point. you again, Julian. Glad to see you all, all uh, on the mend and, and things going well. We're doing it, man. All right. We'll Have see a great you, one. Cheers. Bye.